What's up, everybody? Welcome into another episode of Flipping Bats. It is Monday. We got a new week. We got storylines. The NL Central is wild right now. Do we have a new king of New York City? And first episode of the week, we got power rankings and team of the week. Let's get to it. It's a blowout. It's an intense three. Bases are loaded for Verlander, who waits out of the real man. Swings and it's a high fly ball, deep center field. It is gone. Home run and a huge bat flip to celebrate. All right, Ben, start the show already. A new week is upon us, and this is a big one because it is Field of Dreams week. I will be there. I will shortly be on my way to the cornfields of Iowa. This is going to be a fun week. We're going to do a lot of fun stuff there, so stay tuned for everything Field of Dreams related. But I'm excited for this episode as well because there is a lot to talk about. I got producer Taylor out here with me. Taylor, I don't know if you're ready for this, but there are going to be a lot of corny dad jokes coming from Iowa. Are you are you prepared? Yeah, yeah, I'm preparing myself. It's, it's going to be interesting, all the... The corn and the buttery comments that you're mm-hmm. going to have, it's just going to be fantastic. Just know that they are going to be amazing. <laughs> All right. Let's and with that, let's begin. Let, the jokes are going to be popping. Let's get into it here. It is time to start with the NL Central. That's where I want to start. The Cardinals and the Brewers. Man, do I have a lot to say about the Brewers. But first, let's start with the Cardinals because... Since the trade deadline, they have been in fuego. They're playing really good baseball. The Cardinals have overtaken the Brewers for first place. They now have a two-game lead in the Central, and it is the Cardinals' first division lead since June 22nd. The Brewers had a four-game lead as recently as July 30th. So on July 30th, The Brewers had a four-game lead in the NL Central. Now, just a few days later, it is August 8th. Just a few days later, the Cardinals have a two-game lead in the NL Central. Now, the Cardinals have been very good in this time, and the Cardinals had one dire need to address at the trade deadline. And they did it. They... They were in on Juan Soto. They obviously didn't get that done. Is Juan Soto going to be a massive help to any team? Yes. Maybe aside from the Padres because they haven't been winning many games. (laughs) Just kidding. Sorry, Taylor. Um, The Padres are a very good team. They'll be fine. The Cardinals didn't end up getting Juan Soto. Fine. What they needed to really address was their starting pitching, and they did that. They got Quintana, and they got Jordan Montgomery at the whistle at the bell, at the buzzer, whatever you want to say, from the Yankees. And in his first start, in Jordan Montgomery's first start as a St. Louis Cardinal, he got to face the New York Yankees. How weird is that, by the way? These two teams never play each other. And in his first start, he gets to play the Yankees. And he dominated. Five innings pitched, two hits, zero runs, one walk, and a strikeout. Looked great. Cardinals go on to win that game against the Yankees. They looked very good against the Yankees. The Cardinals dominated the Yankees on the week. This Cardinals team, they're real. So all year long, you've been having Nolan Arenado and Paul Goldschmidt have career years. Tommy Edmond was really good in the first half. O'Neal, Tyler O'Neal wasn't great and, and has turned it on. So this offense is legit. But pitching-wise, they just needed help. Adam Wainwright was not the answer to be the workhorse all year long and the only guy in that rotation. You needed some help. They got help. So now this team is pretty complete, and you have Helsley in the back end of the bullpen who has been one of the best closers in all of baseball. So the combined stat line for the Cardinals pitching acquisitions, Quintana, Stratton, and Montgomery, since the trade deadline, 13 innings pitched, One earned run, a 0.69 ERA, four hits, five walks, a 0.692 whip. I see. Unbelievable. They've been really good. Those are the the acquisitions that they needed. 
and they went out and they got it done. And since the trade deadline, they have been really good. The Cardinals have held their opponents to three runs or less in eight of their 10 games, including three shutouts. They're allowing only two runs per game over their last nine games and have held the Yankees, the number two offense in all of baseball, scoring 5.28 runs per game to only three total runs in the first two games of that series. Now, the last game of the series was obviously a slugfest. They both put up a bunch of runs. Cardinals end up winning. But the Cardinals pitching has been great. And that is a massive reason for why they now have a division lead. The reason the Cardinals are winning the division is because they've played well enough and they have gone on a winning streak seven in a row, which is the longest this season, to get to this point. Now on the other side of things. The reason the Cardinals are winning is because of their win streak. However, the Brewers have just been a massive disappointment. Let's start with their trade deadline. The Brewers were in first place at the trade deadline. At the deadline itself, they had a a three-game lead in the division. They got rid of their closer. Who cares? They were sellers at the deadline. I mean, what are you doing? Selling. Josh Hader, gone. Best closer in baseball over the last couple of years. I know he had struggled in there for a little bit, but he had the most saves in all of baseball when he traded him. You get in return the guy with the second most saves in all of baseball and then a bunch of projects. Denelson Lamette, he's he was a project. And guess what? DFA'd on arrival, basically. He's gone. He's now a Colorado Rocky. And then some prospects. I, I, I don't understand. I don't get what the Brewers were doing. They are a massive disappointment at the trade deadline. And you don't even, you didn't get a top, you didn't get a top prospect back from the Padres for Josh Hader. You've known his contract situation for a while now. So why now decide to trade him away? This is his lowest value. He had a tough month. He has less time left on his contract. Why not last year when he was the best closer in baseball and had a year plus of control? I don't understand. I tweeted this, that the it's ridiculous what the Brewers did at the trade deadline. Not only did they not improve their first place team, they got worse. Now they've lost four games in the standings to the Cardinals and have surrendered first place. When you look at the Brewers, let's, let's look away from the Josh Hader trade, which Look, was it the worst trade in the world? No. You got a good closer in return. You got some prospects. Who knows what they'll be? But who cares about the prospects right now? It's about winning. And having Devin Williams and Josh Hader in the back end of that bullpen sounds a lot better than having Rodgers and Williams. It just does. But take that aside. The Brewers' one drastic need, the one glaring issue, was their offense. They have nobody in their lineup hitting over 270. Nobody, not a single player. Christian Yelich leads the team in batting average at 266. You need offense. You need a big bat. It's pretty obvious. When you're first place in your division and can make your team worse by trading one of your star players at the deadline, you got to pull the trigger, Brewers. This is a treat, a tweet from Christian Snyder. What are you doing? It's just so disappointing. So in five games since trading Josh Hader, this is entering Sunday, the Brewers have allowed four runs in the ninth inning or later, including two walk-off losses to Pittsburgh. Milwaukee blew leads of two-plus runs in all three of its losses against the Pirates this week. You heard that right. All three of the losses to the Pirates. They got swept by the Pittsburgh Pirates. And then they go on to lose two of three to the Reds. This team was clearly shaken up in the locker room by what they did. The players were coming out and saying, yeah, I don't really know what we were doing. It's a little frustrating, but we have to go on and persevere and push through. Well, you get swept by the Pirates, lose two of three to the Reds. This is supposed to be an easy stretch of the schedule. And I don't blame the players one bit. I don't. Yeah, they're shaken up. Rightfully so. 
Their offense didn't improve at all. The back end of their bullpen got worse. Just really frustrating what happened there in the NL Central. What, what's going on with this Brewers team that I had predicted to win the NL Central? I'm changing that. I think the Cardinals win this division now. I don't think the Brewers make the playoffs. I mean, look, I think there's going to be one team in the NL Central that makes the playoffs, and it's going to be the team that wins the division. Other than that, Padres got a spot. Braves or Mets got a spot. And then it's going to come down to the Brewers or Cardinals and the Phillies. And right now, I'll take the Phillies. They at least they at least decided to add at the deadline. They're the one team in the NL East that did anything, really. They got David Robertson. They got Noah Syndergaard. I mean, they went out and made moves. Got Brandon Marsh. Now I'm going down an NL East tangent, but look. The Brewers didn't do enough. In fact, they got a little bit worse, and it's just really disappointing, and it hit them right in the face. By within a week, they've lost five games in the standings, and they're now two games behind the Cardinals after having a four-game lead just about a week ago. Ridiculous. But I want to move on and talk about New York. The city as a whole. Baseball in the state of New York. The Yankees and the Mets. And let's start with the Mets. Man, are they looking good. A massive series. Massive series against the Atlanta Braves. They had five games in there. There was a a built-in doubleheader. Five games in there. The Mets won four of them. They dominated the series. Dominated. They looked fantastic against the Braves team that had that had been the best team in baseball since the beginning of June. Consistency. In the first third of the season, the Mets went 35 and 19. This is from Anthony DiComo. In the second third of the season, the Mets went 34 and 20. So when I sat here a month or so ago, when the Braves had cut their lead down from 10 and a half to a half game and said, look, the Mets don't need to worry. This lead was cut down because of what the Braves were doing, not because of what the Mets were doing. The Mets were doing fine. In fact, they went through a very tough part of their schedule and they did it at a better record uh, than 500. That's all you can ask, really, when they were down Scherzer and DeGrom. The Braves closed that gap, but it all led up to a series against the Mets in Atlanta. A few weeks ago. And the Mets went in there and they went they won two of three games. Now you have the Braves going into New York, into Queens, and they just got their doors blown off. I mean, it really was wild watching how much the Mets dominated that series from start to finish. The Mets are 23 and 10 since July 1st. 23 and 10. 12 and 4 since the All-Star break. On the other side of town, the Yankees. The Yankees are 14 and 18 since July 1st. 6 and 11 since the All-Star break. Just for reference, the Yankees only lost 6 games during the entire month of June. They went 22 and 6. So you have two teams. One that's been good all year long, the Mets, going in an upward trajectory. And then the Yankees, who were supposed to be like the greatest team of all time and on pace to break the all-time wins record set by the Mariners in 01. Now they're going in the opposite direction. I am here to say, again, I said it earlier in the year, and I'll say it again, the Mets are the best team in New York. The Mets are the best team in New York. Even without DeGrom this season, most of the year, he just came back. And on Sunday, he looked phenomenal. Punched out 12 guys in just under six innings. He's looked really good. Healthy. Thank God. That's what you want. Even without DeGrom for most of the season, the Mets enter Sunday ranked fifth in starters ERA. 3.58. All of their starters have a sub-4 ERA. Scherzer, a sub-2 ERA. You add DeGrom into that. So... I know it's kind of a a strong statement that the Mets are the best team in New York, but 
I just have so many question marks with the New York Yankees that I don't have with the Mets. The starting pitching, great for the Yankees. Yes, the the or for the Mets. Yes, the Yankees offense is really, really good. Nobody's doubting that, but there are a lot more question marks. Pitching plays in October, and the Mets have enough offense to support their pitching. The Yankees have now lost five straight, their longest losing streak this season. And entering Sunday, the Mets are 11 and 2 in their last 13 games and have pushed their lead over the Braves in the NL East back up to five and a half games. The Mets have been fantastic. The Yankees have been mediocre at best. If the Mets play, listen to this. If the Mets play just 396 ball the rest of the way, so 396 is in the winning percentage, so 396, well under 500. If they play just 396 ball the rest of the way, they'll finish with their best record since 2006. Guess what the Mets aren't going to do? They're not going to play 396 ball the rest of the way. They're going to play better than that the rest of the way, and they are going to finish with the team's best record since at least 2006. This team is so good. Scherzer and DeGrom at the top of the rotation. Edwin Diaz at the back end, who's been the best closer in baseball. The offense is doing enough to win baseball games. Pete Alonso is tied for the most RBIs in baseball. Francisco Lindor had a good week. I'm going to get to my team of the week here shortly, but trust me, there's going to be some Mets on the list. I really like the Mets team, and I believe that they are the better team in New York. So let's really dive into it. Let's dive into it. We're going to do a little bit of a breakdown here. We're going to go offensively. We're going to go starting pitching. We're going to go bullpen. We're going to go manager. We're going to do it all. And let's start with the offense. Mets versus Yankees. We're going to go different categories, and I'm going to pick either the Mets or the Yankees. Let's start with the offense. Offensively, I'll take the Yankees. The Yankees have... A juggernaut offense. Aaron Judge leading the way there. 43 homers. He's on pace to break Roger Maris's record of 61. And it's not just him. Anthony Rizzo's hitting a bunch of balls out of the yard. Um, A lot of guys around that team. Stanton, who's been hurt for a little while, has been really good. Jose Trevino has been... He's an all-star behind the plate. Andrew Benintendi, you've had him. I mean, look. DJ LeMahieu, big average guy. You look around... It's no secret. The Yankees' offense is better than the Mets. Let's move on to the starting pitching. Offense goes to the Yankees. Starting pitching, the rotation, that goes to the Mets. And this one's not particularly close. The Mets don't have a starter with an ERA of four or greater. You have your guys. You have Jacob deGrom. You have Max Scherzer. Max Scherzer is absolutely ridiculous. 11 strikeouts over seven scoreless in his last start. As expected, he's been at his best in the biggest moments so far this year. Scherzer's ERA on the season is down to 1.98. You bring in Scherzer for the big games. He's been phenomenal, even better in the bigger games. Now Jacob deGrom is back. Two really good starts. And he's healthy. And he's throwing over 100. And his slider's out there 94 miles an hour. Those, that's the one-two punch. And that's the reason for the answer of this question. But everybody else has been good, too. Chris Bassett, sub four. Tywin Walker, sub four. Carrasco. So when it comes to the Mets and their rotation, nobody wants to face them. They match up better than it. They match up really well with anybody because of how good their rotation is. Let's move on to the bullpen. Offense goes to the Yankees. Rotation goes to the Mets. And the bullpen goes to the Mets. This one's simple. They've been good. They've been really good. And the reason for that is Edwin Diaz. Let me list off some numbers for you here. Edwin Diaz, in his last 18 appearances, 18 innings pitched, seven hits, zero earned runs, one walk, and 38 strikeouts in 18 innings pitched. 
He is the best closer in the game of baseball right now. The Yankees, on the other end, are searching for answers. Heraldus Chapman, mm -mm, not the answer. Clay Holmes, phenomenal all year long. He's now showing that he has, he's been getting hit around a little bit. He's still really good. Look, Edwin Diaz is Edwin Diaz, and he's been the best closer in baseball. Clay Holmes isn't the reason that I'm picking the Mets bullpen over the Yankees. It's not. I just like the depth there on the Mets side of things a little bit better. Edwin Diaz, Adam Adovino has been good. Look, Seth Lugo looks better. Bullpen-wise, I'm taking the Mets, and it's because Edwin Diaz has been historically good, and he is on a pace to break the all-time strikeout per nine-inning record. He's at, like, 19 in his last 18 appearances. 19 strikeouts per nine. Think about that. There's only 27 outs per game. He's striking out 19 of them over the course of nine innings. That's how good he has been. I will take the Mets bullpen over the Yankees. The Yanks just have too many question marks with Chad Green. Look, before the year, this answer was simple. Yankees. But it's not anymore. Chad Green goes down. Tommy John, out for the year. Michael King, out for the year. Aroldis Chapman, injuries. Comes back. He's not the same. He is not the same Aroldis Chapman. Clay Holmes, he's been the bright spot in that bullpen. But all in all, give me the Mets bullpen right now. Next up, manager. When it comes to manager, I'm going to take the Buck Truck. Buck Showalter. By the way, I don't even know if that's a nickname for him. I made that up earlier today, and it's really simple. Buck rhymes with truck, and I just have run with it ever since. The Buck Truck, I, and I like it. Buck Showalter has been really good, and so many players. If you talk to players from around the league that have played with him, specifically, I had Adam Jones on the podcast earlier this year. Oriole legend Adam Jones played under Buck Showalter for a while. He said himself, perhaps the, the Mets' best pickup was Buck Showalter. Yeah, they get Max Scherzer. That's a big one. They get um, Starling Marte, all-star. Mark Canna, good. Edwin, uh, Eduardo Escobar. But Buck Showalter has the respect of legends in the game. And it's for a reason. And I, I like him a lot. And when it comes to Aaron Boone, just to be quite honest with you, I, I don't know if he should have still had a job to this point. Now, now the Yankees have been great this year. I'm not advocating for Aaron Boone to, to not have his job right now. They've been one of the, one of the best teams, one of the best Yankees teams we've seen. But look, if you're the New York Yankees and you haven't won a world series in over a decade, the manager's got to, got to go at some point. Are the, are the Yankees okay just getting into the playoffs and then losing in the first or second round? I don't think so. And there's been some, there's been some moves that I just, don't think are great for the Yankees over the last few years. So when it comes to manager, I don't think that I don't think one of the managers is a weakness towards their team, but I think Buck Showalter is doing more for the team than Aaron Boone is doing for the Yankees. Next up. And lastly, we got defense. So what have we done here? Yankees offense, rotation, Mets, bullpen, Mets, Manager, Mets. Defense, I'm going to go Yankees. The Yankees' defense has been a lot of fun to watch this year. None of these teams' defense is a weakness, might I add. The Yankees has just been really good. Anthony Rizzo over at first base. Gold Glove first baseman, he's good. Aaron Judge in the outfield. We all talk about how good he is offensively. Aaron Judge defensively is a star as well. Really good out there in the outfield. Benintendi, so good in the outfield. Shortstop, IKF, Isaiah Kiner, Falefa, gold glove winner in the infield. You look around the team, there's just a lot of a lot of gold gloves for the Yankees on defense. And for that reason, I'm picking them. So look, I'm saying the Mets are the better team in New York. Do I think it's a blowout? No, absolutely not. These two teams are phenomenal. The state of baseball in New York is so freaking good right now. It is close. It is tight, but let's not forget that the Mets just recently played the Yankees in Queens. Yankees come in, the Mets dominate, swept them. So look, all in all right now, I think the Mets are better. You look head to head, the Mets are better. 
So the state of baseball in New York is really good, but when it comes to the Mets, I think they're the more dangerous team. And nobody, I mean nobody, wants to play the Mets in the playoffs. Who wants to match up with DeGrom and Scherzer? Uh Uh-uh, nobody. So I'm going to take the Mets in the city of New York and the state. One and one, by the way. City and state, they're both the same thing. I'm going to take the Mets in New York. I think that leads well. Taylor, do we have a... Power ranking? Is it power rankings time? Power rankings time. It's power rankings time. We can let the people know it's power rankings time. We'll let the people know that it is now time for my new and improved. Well, I don't know if it's improved. I liked them last week, honestly. But my new top 10 Major League Baseball power rankings. And that conversation is going to lead well right into it. The Mets and the Yankees, where are they going to be? Towards the top. Spoiler alert. But how far at the top? We will find out. Let's start. At number 10. At number 10, I have the Seattle Mariners. Full disclosure, this one came down. Mariners twins. Um, Twins haven't looked good of late. They still lead the Central, but they're not playing great baseball. The Mariners haven't been as dominant as before the deadline, but who has been? They were were before the All-Star break. They were won 14 games in a row before the break, but they're still 59 and 51. Jesse Winker heating up, hit a grand slam on Sunday. They win on Sunday. They're in a wild card spot as of right now. I just really like the team. Julio Rodriguez has been out. He's expected to come back this this week. And he's the catalyst of this team. The young 21-year-old stud is the guy on this team. But I really like the rotation as well. They're here at number 10. Moving on to number 9, the Philadelphia Phillies. The Phillies are hot. Nick Castellanos is playing good. They made the moves they needed to at the trade deadline. That's what this playoff run is going to come down to. In my opinion, the Phillies are going to get in, and they did the right things at the deadline to do it. Adding Noah Syndergaard, they needed a rotation guy. Added David Robertson, they needed a bullpen guy. Added Brandon Marsh, they needed a center fielder. Offensively, is he the best center fielder? Probably not. Defensively, is he the best Quite honestly, he's up there in the defensive metrics. He's very good out there defensively. So I like what the Phillies did. I have them here at number nine. Moving on to number eight, the St. Louis Cardinals. Talked about them a lot at the top of the show. They have been really good. Seven wins in a row, which is the the best for them this year, the best winning streak they've been on. Obviously, Paul Goldschmidt, Nolan Arenado are having career years. Offensively, they've been really good, but they did what they needed to at the deadline. Added Quintana, added Jordan Montgomery. Pitching-wise, they've been good. They're playing good baseball. They're here at number eight. Moving on, number seven, the San Diego Padres. Padres have fallen a little bit here, and it's just because, look, I do think they got better, way better at the trade deadline, but it hasn't all clicked yet. You had Josh Hader, you had Juan Soto, you had Josh Bell, Brandon Jury. This team is better post-trade deadline, but they haven't been playing like it yet. They didn't look good at all against the Dodgers. Um, they lose a game to the Rockies. They do dominate one of those games after after the trades were made. So look, I'm not overanalyzing this. They're a better team post-trade deadline. They're just not clicking yet. I had to move them down a tick. They are here at 61-49 and 49 at number seven. Moving on, number six, the Toronto Blue Jays. It's their offense. It's their offense. It's their offense. Starting pitching-wise, disappointment at the trade deadline. They should have added a starting pitcher. I would have felt so good. Preseason, as a lot of you will remember, preseason, I had the Blue Jays in the World Series. Would things change a little bit now? Probably. We'll see when it comes time for October. Well, I'll do an updated playoff bracket, which you all know how good that was last year. But... Look, I don't know if I don't know if I can have the Blue Jays a World Series team right now. Is their offense good enough? Yes. Is their bullpen good enough? They upgraded it, and it could be right now. Jordan Romano in the back end is really good. They added a lot of pieces. I don't think they have the starting pitching to get there, and I was disappointed they didn't do much at the trade deadline. But they're still really good. They're here at number six, 60 and 48, coming in at number six. And number five, the Atlanta Braves. I do believe the Braves are going to be a playoff team, but the the matchup against the Mets over the weekend showed that the Mets are the team in the NL East. The Mets are the team to beat in the East. The Braves did not look good. The Braves got dominated 
by the Mets. Now, am I going to move the Braves down a ton for that? No. Since the beginning of June, the Braves have been one of the best teams in baseball. They still are one of the better teams in the game of baseball. They're really good. They close that gap down from double digits in the NL East. But it's back above five games now because of what the Mets did. But in the wild card race, the Braves are still right there. The Braves will get into the playoffs. That's not a worry of mine. They're a very good team. By the way, congratulations to Austin Riley for getting paid over $200 million, 10 years for Austin Riley. Good for him. Good for the Atlanta Braves. Love seeing that. Good pick up there. He'll be at third base for a long time to come for that Braves team. Moving on to number four. This is where the changes start. At number four this week, I have the New York Yankees. That's right. The Yankees are down a little bit. They're sitting here at 70 and 39. Very good record. Going to dominate in the AL East. They will win the AL East. That is not a concern of mine. But I do have concerns for the Yankees. So I, they were at number one for the longest time all year. Finally bumped them out of there a couple weeks ago. And now they're here at number four. Their concerns, those concerns start in the bullpen. Obviously, Aaron Judge is carrying this team. They're very good. The, the offense is carrying this team. I have the Yankees here at number four. At number three, I have the New York Mets. I have bumped them up ahead of the Yankees for the first time in a while. They are 70 and 39. Same number of wins. This Mets team is so freaking good. I love watching this Mets team. Queens has been electric for Mets games. Edwin Diaz, the most electric walkout song in the game of baseball, the most dominant closer in the game of baseball right now. Their offense is doing enough. Jacob deGrom is back. Scherzer is dominating. This was the Mets team we expected at the beginning of the year with Scherzer and deGrom at the top of the rotation. Now you have Jacob deGrom back. Finally, he broke the all-time record for strikeouts in the starting pitcher's first 200 games. Man. This team is fun, and I have them here at number three. At number two, the Houston Astros. The Astros are good. We all know that. They've been okay since the trade deadline, a little up and down. Didn't do great against the Red Sox. Um, didn't, you, you know, played well against the Guardians, lose that last game, one nothing. But look, in the American League, there's two clear top two teams when it comes to playoffs the goal is to get one of the top two seeds because then you'll you'll get a buy with this new playoff format the top two teams are the Yankees and the Astros the Astros are playing much better right now the Astros are really good they will grab one of those top two seeds no argument from me there Astros are dominant but I have them here at number two meaning at number one Coming in out of the NL West, it is the Los Angeles Dodgers, 74 and 33, the best record in baseball. Entering Sunday, they entered with a 29 and 5 record in their last 34 games, 14 and 3 since the All Star break. Current seven game win streak entering Sunday, fifth winning streak of seven plus games this season. And they are now on pace. For a franchise record, 112 wins. Not overthinking it. It's the Dodgers. They are dominant. They are dominating. They are the clear, right now, number one in baseball. 74 and 33. And the Dodgers round out my top 10 power rankings. I saw them over the week. I went and watched them play the Padres. The Padres, the new and improved team, everybody's talking about them. And I myself believe the Padres are improved and they are a very good team and they are a playoff team. The, jo the Dodgers flexed their muscles there. I mean, dominant, dominated them. And it was cool to be there for the, the Vin Scully um, thing they did pregame there on Friday. Really cool moment. You just knew the Dodgers were going to win that game and they came out and dominated for Vin dominated the next game, dominated the Padres in the series, and they are now dominating and at the top of my new updated top 10 Major League Baseball power rankings. Yeah, Ben, tough to uh, see the Dodgers there at the top spot, but I don't disagree. They uh, beat the Padres handedly, but I also think they're a team that benefits from having that bye, which is not the case for all teams. Yeah, you know, the bye... 
I, I, I'm interested to see it this year because I'm not so sure a buy is always the – it's baseball, and you play 162 games and not many more days than that. And when you're rolling, you just want to keep rolling. And I will forever remember uh, the, the Tigers teams that my brother was a part of that went to the World Series twice. Both times, they swept the ALCS. And my brother swears that that hurt. That's what hurt us, is we had too much downtime. And in the other situations, you had... The, the Giants coming in, you know, after a tough series, and then the Cardinals in 06 coming in after a tough series, and then the Tigers had all that downtime. I'm not so sure it's the answer. I'm interested to see how teams like it now that it's going to be a thing for moving forward. So we'll see, but you, you make a good point. But why do you say why do you say the Dodgers of anyone you think have been well, more? Everyone's hurt. Walker Buehler yeah, everyone Walker is. Buehler hasn't pitched since when uh yeah. kershaw just went on the il they're allegedly getting dustin may back so it would probably benefit them to yeah. give their guys a little more time but again it'll be interesting to watch as we all know that baseball players are very much creatures of habit yeah but are you ready to move on to your team of the week yes i am my friend and let everyone know how many mets have made this team <laughs> all right let's head on over to the board it is time for this week's team of the week going position by position picking the best at every position for the week that was let's start at catcher this week my catcher will smith i saw him up close and personal there at dodger stadium this week he was so good 417 on the week a homer six rbis even added in a stolen base will smith of the dodgers has been since he took over that starting spot for the dodgers there's an argument for him being the best catcher in the game of baseball and this week he was definitely the best catcher. Moving on to first base. At first, I have Pete Alonzo. 375, three homers, nine RBIs. Up there in the lead, tied for the league lead in RBIs entering Sunday, he was. Pete Alonzo had another good week. He's a big reason for the Mets' success this year, but not the only reason. In years past, it seemed like if Pete wasn't hitting, the Mets weren't going to win. This year it's different, but he was hitting this week. He is my first baseman. Moving on, let's go to second base. At second base, I have Jeff McNeil, another New York Met. 452 and a homer and five RBIs, an all-star this year. I played against Jeff McNeil a lot in the minor leagues. We actually became pretty good friends in the minor leagues, and this guy pays such close attention to his craft, and he's so meticulous in the way he goes about things, and... He's just a lot of fun to watch play the game of baseball. He was then, and he is now that I'm watching him on the big screen. And it's good to see him be an all-star this year. He's shown in years past how good he can be, but then there were some injuries, and then there was a year where he struggled, and now he's back to being really good. This week, he was phenomenal, 452 on the week. Let's move on over to third base. My third baseman on the team of the week, Alec Bohm. Bohm hit 364, two homers, four RBIs. And it's not just this week. In the month of July, if it weren't for Austin Riley, and Austin Riley had an unbelievable, unprecedented month where he broke the all-time Braves record for extra base hits. If it weren't for Austin Riley, Alec Bohm would have been the best third baseman in the month. And it was actually pretty close with Austin Riley that month. But he continued to take it into August. Alec Bohm had a great first week. Two homers, four RBIs, 364. He's my third baseman. Let's move on to shortstop. Francisco Lindor, first base, second base, shortstop, all New York Mets. Lindor hit 400 with two homers, eight RBIs on the week. The Mets are rolling. They played so well against the Atlanta Braves. Lindor, it is so good to see him back to having a really good year. The Lindor of the past, we forgot about it because he wasn't very good last year. The Lindor with the Cleveland Indians, now the Guardians, was perhaps the best shortstop in the game of baseball. Now we're seeing him back in that form, and he's here on my team of the week. Let's move to the outfield. Three outfielders, regardless of their spe specific position, we'll start first outfielder, Tyler Naquin, New York Mets. What a theme we got here this week. By far the most, this is the most this has ever happened on my team of the week, but the Mets are dominating this. Tyler Naquin was so good. 421, two homers, four RBIs in his first few games. 
with the New York Mets. Just comes, makes an immediate difference, and he is now here in his first week with the Mets. He is now on my Team of the Week for the first time. Next up, my next outfielder, Team of the Week, Mookie Betts. Mookie's been on this list a lot. 333, two homers, seven RBIs, a stolen base, really good defense. We all know how good Mookie Betts is, and he just keeps proving it again and again and again. And the Dodgers get, just keep winning again and again and again. My last outfielder this week is Nick Castellanos of the Philadelphia Phillies. He had not been very good so far this year, but now he's turning it on. 429, two homers, two RBIs, a slower year for him, but we all know the hitter he can be. It's this guy. It's this Nick that we saw over the course of the past week. Friend of the pod, by the way. We talked a lot about hitting. That was a lot of fun. So that episode was a while ago, though. So if you want to go back and listen to it, you can. 429, and it got him. It might be for the first time on my team of the week this week. Let's move on. Designated hitter, Daniel Vogelbach, New York Mets. Vogel unit, 318, two homers, six RBIs. On Sunday, we saw him scoring first to home. He was rolling around the bases. Unbelievable. Like a freight train. It is unbelievable. This guy is so much fun to watch. I really like watching him hit. I really like watching him run the bases. And this week, he is my DH on my team of the week. Now for the pitchers. Starting pitcher and closer will start on the mound at my starting pitcher, Reed Detmers. Two starts, 1-0 on the mound, 1.29 ERA, 19 strikeouts and 14 innings pitched. You know if you're getting a win on the mound for the Angels, you're doing something really, really good because they're not winning a lot of games. They're not scoring many runs. He dominated two starts and a 1.29 ERA. 19 strikeouts and 14 innings pitch. This is the Reed Detmers that I watched up close and personal in person at Angels Stadium in Anaheim when he threw a no-hitter. I was there earlier this year. That was the Reed Detmers I saw. He wasn't very good for a while after that, went down, got sent down, comes back up, and he has been really good since. So hopefully he went down and figured some things out because he is a really bright young star in the game of baseball. And to round out my team of the week, my closer on my team of the week, Liam Hendricks of the Chicago White Sox. Three saves on the week, five innings pitched, five Ks, and not a single earned run given up. Only one hit. So I really like this. This is a good team of the week. The Mets dominated. They played really good baseball against a really good team in the Atlanta Braves. And now you look at my team of the week, and it feels like half of it is Mets. I honestly think it is. One, two, three, four, five. Half of my team of the week is New York Mets, deservedly so. But let's finish with my player of the week. And my flipping bats player of the week is... Drum roll, please. Francisco Lindor of the New York Mets. I love this. Mr. Smile, he's playing such good baseball. Two homers on the week, 400 average, an OPS of 1.139. Knocked in eight runs, eight RBIs on the week. Look, this is just so nice to see. You know he went to New York last year, didn't have a good year and struggled with that. He got paid tons of money to come in and be the guy of the future at shortstop for the Mets. And he struggled. And I'm sure mentally that was tough on him. And now he's having a much better year. He's having, he's having a great year on a winning team. He's putting up, up good numbers. But as, apart from just winning, I'm sure the best thing in his mind that he has accomplished this year is that he is now the player of the week for flipping bats. And I love that it is Lindor. What a good week for him. What a good week for the New York Mets. They are a force to be reckoned with. When you look at the National League, yes, the Dodgers are there. But the Mets match up well with everybody they are going to play. They are going to be a force come October. And Francisco Lindor, my player of the week, is going to be a big, big part of it. But that does it for my team and player of the week. And that does it for this Monday episode. As I said at the beginning... It's Field of Dreams time. I am shortly taking off for Iowa. I will be coming to you soon from the cornfield, but that's not until after 
the Tuesday episode, which will be coming to you normal tomorrow, normal Tuesday episode. But then middle of the week, things get different and interesting from Iowa. Make sure you check that out. It's going to be a blast. So stay tuned right here. Subscribe. Make sure you're ready everywhere you listen to podcasts, Apple, Spotify, Google, Flippin' Bats Pod. Subscribe to it. Rate it five stars. Also, we're on all social media. Keep up with everything there. Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok as well, at Flippin' Bats Pod. And we can also be found on YouTube. You can watch every single episode on YouTube on this beautiful set, Flippin' Bats Pod as well. But this has been a great Monday episode. I hope you all enjoyed it, and I will see you tomorrow for another episode of Flippin' Bats.